The city of Southampton, affectionately known as the Gateway to the Empire, had been an important seaport since the Norman conquests. Today, it was just as important, but much more hectic. Charlie could see steam cranes all around him and gantries loading cargo and barrels onto the waiting ships. Dozens of ships were lined up in neat rows along the quayside, but the one that captured Charlie's attention the most was the huge steamship that towered above him. The SS Osiris was a 300-foot-long express steamer belonging to the prestigious P&O line. Its funnels spewed black smoke as the boilers were being fired in readiness for their long journey to Egypt. Charlie and Samson stood on the dockside amidst the hustle-bustle of activity as the ship's great whistle suddenly sounded. Well, Charlie Waterman, here's your chance for fame and fortune, and to do great things, Samson said, only half-jokingly. Charlie shook the other man's outstretched hand eagerly. I really appreciate your help, Mr. Sampson, he said gratefully. Thank you once again. Oh, don't worry about it, Charlie. As I said before, I'm happy to help you out. I've got to spend some of my hard-earned cash sometime. He smiled as he said the last sentence. Are you driving your car home yourself? Charlie asked, casting a glance in the direction of Sampson's automobile parked on the dockside. Yes, Charlie. Once you've sailed, I'll take her back up to Doncaster. I'm quite looking forward to getting her out on the open road. The main drag up from London is wide and long. I should get her up to full speed. He smiled and clapped Charlie on the back, and then, quite unexpectedly, grabbed hold of him and hugged him tightly. I never had a son of my own, Charlie. Never got married, in fact. But if I had had a son, I'm sure that he would be just like you. Please be careful, Charlie, and stay out of trouble, or at least leave the trouble to Max. Charlie, surprised by this sudden outflow of emotion from Samson, glanced toward the gangplank where Max waited silently. The whistle blew again just at that minute, and Max made a pointed production of opening his watch and examining it. Samson laughed. Go on, Charlie. Max hates to be late. Keep me posted of any developments. All the arrangements have been made for you, so don't worry about a thing. Bon voyage. Charlie grinned back, hoisted his grandfather's rucksack over his shoulder, and walked over to the gangplank. Max fell into place behind him as they ascended up to the ship. With all pre-departure checks complete, the gangplank was raised and stowed, and the restraining ropes were let go as the great ship pulled slowly away from the dock. The ship's whistle blew three short blasts to indicate a ship leaving port, and the captain rang full ahead on the telegraph system as the ship started its journey down the Solent and out into the English Channel. Charlie stood at the stern rail, waving as the figure of Samson disappeared into the distance. He felt a tinge of sadness as he realized that his father had not been here to see him off and that a complete stranger had shown him more affection than his own father had done in years. He pulled out his grandfather's telescope, watching the coastline fade away as the Osiris steamed a southeasterly course. He dug into the rucksack again and retrieved the pendant compass, watching its needle move as they approached the Isle of Wight. Then he looped the cord around his neck and tucked the compass inside his shirt. Standing on the starboard side, he was able to appreciate the glorious sunset as the sun sank beneath the waves of the English Channel and he took a deep breath of sea air. At last, he was on his great adventure. He inhaled deeply again and exhaled, trying to banish his misgivings. The SS Osiris steamed gracefully away into the distance, leaving a thin wisp of grey smoke in its trail as the only reminder that it had ever been there. Edward Sampson waited until the steamship had disappeared over the horizon and then walked calmly over to his motor car by the loading cranes, where a dock official was waiting for him patiently. Will you be leaving the car with us for long, Mr. Sampson? He asked politely. About six weeks, I guess, Sampson replied. I want you to put her into secure storage until my return. Very good, sir but you told that young man you were going back to Doncaster tonight. No, not at all, Samson replied. You are mistaken. I sail tonight on the overnight ferry to Le Havre. 
I expect to be on a train to Marseille tomorrow morning. Very well, sir. I must have misheard you. I'll have you bags taken up to the taxi rank if you like. Samson slipped his hand into his overcoat pockets and handed the official a crisp one-pound note from his wallet. I don't want you to tell a soul where I am going. Do you understand me? I don't want anyone to know about this. Of course, sir, replied the dock official, pocketing the pound note quickly with a knowing smile. I won't tell a soul. Don't you worry about that. I won't tell a single soul. Dinner on board ship turned out to be a very posh affair. Charlie was invited to sit at the captain's table, which also included an army general en route to a new posting in the Middle East and two elderly ladies bundled up in a quantity of shawls, accompanied by stout walking sticks. The snapping liveliness of their eyes showed that they weren't giving up on life any time in the near future. The table was rounded out by a middle-aged, studious-looking fellow named Moses Chatsworth and his daughter Rosie. She was a tall and attractive young woman with auburn hair, freckles sprinkled across her nose, and full red lips. Not a beauty by conventional standards, but striking nonetheless. Although she maintained a demure expression, it was clear that she was interested to have someone her own age at the table. Max had been invited to sit with them, but characteristically, he had chosen to dine alone at the other end of the dining salon. From time to time, Max threw a disapproving stare in Charlie's direction. The small party of diners made desultory conversation while the stewards brought round a variety of delicacies ranging from sweet crab meat to tender asparagus to filet mignon, all served on fine china with a gold rim. The tableware was heavy weight, sterling silver with P&O engraved on it. The serving dishes were also made of the gold-rimmed china. In an effort to make conversation, the captain turned to Chatsworth and remarked, I understand that you are a scholar of Egyptology, Mr. Chatsworth. Chatsworth replied, Not precisely, Captain. There are certain topics which have captured my interest, particularly the ancient Egyptian calendar. I have obtained an official permit to carry out a survey in Egypt. Chatsworth's daughter, Rosie, remained silent, although she occasionally cast a shy glance in Charlie's direction. Dinner concluded shortly thereafter. The General and Chatsworth both accepted the captain's offer of a drink and a cigar in the smoking lounge. The elderly ladies toddled off on an undisclosed errand. Oblivious to the interest in Rosie's eyes, Charlie politely made his farewells and went for a quick stroll on the deck before bed. The Osiris was sailing more or less parallel to the French coast. Very soon it would turn the corner near Brest and head southwest across the Bay of Biscay. Charlie removed his grandfather's telescope from his pocket and peered through it, curious as to whether he would be able to see anything, but they were too far out at sea for him to pick out anything on the horizon. The sky was a velvet blue-black, its stars reflecting in the midnight-colored water like tiny gleaming jewels. A full moon hung overhead, its face laughing down at its mirror image. The air was crisp, but not excessively so. Charlie's dinner jacket provided sufficient warmth. Gazing out at the water and the night sky, he wondered what Victoria was doing. Don't worry, he said quietly to himself. I'll be back before you know it and we'll be married, despite your misgivings about me. Or so he hoped. It was three in the afternoon. Alex Waterman sat alone in the office of his law firm with his head in his hands. His life was in pieces. He felt miserable and totally depressed. Since Charlie had left for Egypt, he had been sad, and now he was doing some serious soul-searching. The truth of the matter was that he missed his son terribly, and he felt guilty about the way that things had turned out for the both of them. It had all started out well when Charlie was born. At first, Alex had been totally overjoyed with his new son, and the small boy had quickly become the apple of his father's eye. But business had always come before home life, and Alex had spent all of his time at work. Charlie had quickly become neglected. As the law business flourished, Alex had become well-liked in the legal community, 
and all his time had been spent mingling with acquaintances. Alex had been very ambitious, and he intended to climb the ladder of success all the way. This was good for business, but not good for Charlie. Charlie's mother had also suffered. Long hours stuck at home with Charlie and with no real support from her husband. It hadn't been very long before she had wandered and had found comfort in the arms of another man. Of course, Alex had been too busy to notice what was going on, or even care for that matter. With his head down, he had continued in the same vein for many years until the whole work thing had become just a habit, and there was no time left for any real enjoyment of life. To the casual outsider, he had become a bitter and twisted, money-oriented person. But he didn't see any of this happening until it was all too late. The initial excitement of building up a successful law firm had started to wane, and some of the more recent lawsuits he had conducted had made him realize that there was more to life than success and money. The money was nice, of course, but as he sat there now in his office, alone, he realized that his son was the only thing that he really cared about. It seemed that all he had ever done to Charlie was to confront him and manipulate him. Now that Charlie had become a young man, with a mind of his own, they had had one argument after another, usually about money, and this had alienated the two of them. And of course, there was always the recurring argument about the hall. Alex had never particularly cared for Wilton Hall. He had always preferred life in the city to being stuck out in the middle of the remote countryside with those damned shrieking birds. But the cold, hard fact was that when Grandfather died, the Crown's portion of the inheritance taxes would have made keeping it very difficult. Grandfather had left debts which had to be paid, and Alex's own divorce settlement had taken a large bite out of his funds. If he'd kept the hall, what little would have been left in his available capital would have been insufficient to pay for its maintenance, and there was a good chance that Charlie would have had to leave school as well, which was not an option. The only possible way to make the estate pay for itself would have been to convert it to a successful working farm or open the hall and probably the nature reserve to the public for a fee. Instead, he would decided to sell it at auction. Charlie did not agree with this decision, and they had fallen out about it. But Charlie didn't know the full story. Charlie didn't know the half of it. The door opened suddenly, and a clerk entered the room without knocking. Alex's thoughts turned immediately to the present. He wiped his eyes before turning to face the man. Your three o'clock appointment. He's in your office now, and he seems to be getting a little agitated. Yes, all right, Hawkins. I'll be through in a moment. Tell him I'll be just one more minute. Hawkins left the room quietly as Alex walked slowly over to the large picture window, pulling the blinds to one side to get a better look outside. He could see the afternoon rush hour traffic queuing down the busy road outside. The vehicles were making progress along the road, but very slowly. He watched them deep in thought. Then he wiped the tears from his eyes and put on his jacket. Picking his papers up from the desk, he strode out of the boardroom. He had things to do. The Osiris docked gratefully at Gibraltar on the morning of the third day of the voyage for refueling and its equally relieved passengers alit to enjoy solid ground for a while and to do some exploring. It was a gloriously sunny day and the usual cloud that sometimes hung over the rock of Gibraltar, the Levante, was nowhere to be seen. Charlie disembarked from the ship which was docked at the North Mole and briefly looked across to the Royal Navy Harbor, temporarily at a loss as to what to do. Noticing his hesitation, Rosie Chatsworth stepped up beside him and laid her hand on his arm. Father and I are going to explore the town a little, and then stop somewhere for tea. Would you like to accompany us? Charlie glanced at Max, who had appeared silently as usual, at his other side, his face expressionless. Max, Care to come along? The other man nodded. As a matter of fact, I would, Mr. Waterman. There's many interesting sights to see in Gibraltar. As they wandered through the double archways of the North Bastion, a tea room beckoned, 
and Charlie and the Chatsworths sat down outside to indulge suddenly hungry stomachs. Max contemplated the menu for a moment, then excused himself, but not without stopping to take a long, hard glance around the inoffensive tea room. Apparently satisfied by what he saw, he removed himself to the pub next door to indulge in a pint of their best ale. Initial hunger pangs assuaged, and on their second round of tea, Charlie made a difficult decision. Chatsworth looked trustworthy enough, he thought. The man did seem to have an honest face. Turning to Chatsworth, he confided his plan to dig for the marker stone at Saqqara. To be honest, sir, I have no idea what I am doing. Would you be willing to help me? Chatsworth looked dubious. You've little or no chance of getting a permit. They have to be obtained months in advance. I know that now, Charlie replied quickly. That's why I thought you might be able to help. The other man still looked doubtful, so Charlie decided to give him some encouragement. Here, sir, let me show you this. Quickly, reluctant to let Chatsworth spend too much time with it, he displayed a few pages of the notebook and related pertinent parts of the story, a belated feeling of caution preventing him from saying too much. Chatsworth was oblivious to that possibility. His eyes had already lit up when he saw the diagrams. Sundial calculations. My word, Charlie, this is exactly the sort of thing that I love to work on. Of course I'll help you. He pondered for a moment. Right. Yes, that's what I'll do. I think I can have my permit transferred to Saqqara, and I can also work out where the sun will cast its shadow, so we don't have to wait for the winter equinox. That means that we will be able to start digging right away. A small sliver of guilt at taking advantage of the other man's mania inserted itself into Charlie's brain. I'm afraid I can't give you any of the proceeds if we find treasure, he said. I've promised to turn any artifacts that we may find over to the authorities. Chatsworth shook his head. I'm not interested in money, Charlie. No, I will help you just for the sake of helping. After all, if we find this, I can then tell people how I calculated the locations of the secret places. They'll take my theories seriously then. The idea that Chatsworth would help just for the sake of helping, and for no financial gain, seemed a worthy suggestion that his grandfather would have approved of. So Charlie shook Chatsworth's hand happily, pleased by the turn of events. As he looked up, he caught a strange expression in Rosie's eyes, which shifted as she became aware of his regard and she lowered her eyelashes coyly. She was certainly a flirt, he thought, but he couldn't help but continue to gaze at her as she batted her eyelashes at him again. Across the square, in the shadows near the small church on the corner, a pair of eyes observed them all. The individual was soon joined by another, and they began a conversation, hands occasionally gesticulating. The first figure began to shake his head, more firmly as the conversation continued. No, nothing can be done here. There are too many people about. Wire Abdul in Alexandria to acquire the notebook there. However, he must make it appear to be a robbery. And the young gentleman? The other inquired. If he should attempt to prevent such an act? Tired and irritable from the Osiris's voyage and the resulting discomfort in the crew quarters, Donovan Brady shrugged callously. Take whatever action is required. Do you understand? Whatever action is required, just get me the notebook. The Osiris docked briefly at Malta, waiting in the Grand Harbor only long enough for cargo to be loaded and for the ship to be refueled. Then it continued on its slow journey to Egypt. On the last day before their arrival at Alexandria, Charlie stood on the promenade deck, leaning against the guardrail and trying to sight land through his grandfather's telescope. He was so involved in this pursuit that he failed to notice Rosie's arrival until she spoke. In ancient times, you could have seen the pharaohs from here. Charlie jumped slightly but managed to avoid dropping the telescope. Rosie laughed. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. She closed her eyes for a moment to enjoy the balmy breeze. I love this weather, so warm and comfortable after the cold damp of England. 
You have a point, Charlie admitted. You were saying about the lighthouse? Rosie came closer to him and nodded. Yes, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, along with the hanging gardens of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the Mausoleum of Mausolos at Halicarnassus. She stopped, eyes narrowing. Why do you look so surprised, Charlie? He stammered. No, I wasn't. Well, it's unusual for a woman to be so knowledgeable, she snapped, then relented at his stricken look. Charlie shook his head. No, of course not. Rosie actually laughed. It's my unconventional upbringing. My mother died when I was very young, and father took me along on most of his excursions rather than spend his leisure time away from me, and he enjoyed sharing his knowledge about the ancient world. I'm particularly interested in Egyptian mythology and hieroglyphs. I've even learned how to read them, she shrugged. That kind of in-depth knowledge can be a little off-putting to some types of gentlemen. Charlie considered for a moment. Not to me, he said stoutly. I like women who can think. She moved a little closer to him, enough for him to briefly wonder why he had not noticed how enchanting the sprinkle of freckles across the bridge of her nose was. Really? she asked, putting her hand on his arm. Really? Charlie replied firmly his free hand, moving almost with a mind of its own, starting to reach towards her to pull her closer to him. She was tall, much taller than Victoria. He barely had to bend his head down to... Excuse me, Mr. Waterman. Once again, Max had made a silent entrance. Charlie jumped and almost dropped the telescope again. He turned and barely restrained himself from glaring at the other man. Yes, Max? The steward has informed me that the final table setting for luncheon will be starting in five minutes. We are expected to make harbor in less than two hours. He turned and walked away as noiselessly as he had arrived. Rosie stared after him. Does he do that often? She asked, pouting slightly. I'm afraid so, Charlie answered ruefully. I don't know if that's his normal manner or if he's doing it to annoy me. For some reason I believe he resents me, but I don't know why he should. Turning away from the rail, he crooked his elbow for her. But right now, I think we should concentrate on our final meal on this wonderful ship. Would you join me for luncheon, Miss Chatsworth? Rosie nodded happily and placed her hand on his arm, basking in the warmth of his regard. Lead on, Mr. Waterman, she replied, happily planning the next stage of her campaign to win his heart. Alexandria was a teeming mass of humanity. Arab longshoremen labored to load and unload cargo in a constant stream of rapid-fire conversation, including occasional gesticulations. European tourists wandered in small clumps along the dock as new arrivals got their bearings and located transportation to their next destination or were met by small welcoming committees. English, French, and German conversation swirled in and out of the throng, with the occasional Italian or even Russian cutting through. Merchants pulling handcarts containing a myriad of wares weaved in and out of the traffic as they looked for likely customers. One attempting to importune Charlie was summarily discouraged by Max, who merely bent a disapproving scowl on the would-be profiteer. Donkeys and camels added their unique voices and aromas to the salt air, already richly scented with the smell of oranges, cinnamon, fish, and incense. Charlie was amazed by the variety of the assault on his senses and would have mentioned it if Max hadn't taken his elbow firmly. This way, Mr. Waterman, he said tersely, and towed the gawking young Englishman firmly along to a line of carriages waiting for passengers. With a signal to the young Arab following with their luggage, Max hailed one and efficiently deposited his charge and their baggage, then climbed aboard himself. Take us to the railway station, please, he ordered, and they started off. Accustomed to the large, heavy black monsters which snorted their way through the British countryside, 
Charlie gaped at the elegant steam train which stood waiting to take them to Cairo. For one thing, instead of black, its color was a deep, rich russet, portions of which sported carefully interwoven Arabic designs in white, black, and gold. Brass fittings gleamed, and even the metal spokes on the train's wheels shone. The smokestack, emitting a fine cloud of blue-white smoke, rose in a thinner funnel than its English cousin, and even the whistle, which sounded then, had a more nasal, delicate sound. The passenger cars, similarly outfitted, looked almost like they belonged in a circus train. Inside, the spacious compartments were equally ornate. The seats were a deep, soft leather, and there were ornate rugs on the floor of the carriage. Velvet curtains adorned the windows, tied back with tasseled silk ropes. The tables were mahogany, with solid pedestals to keep them from moving with the motion of the train. Charlie settled into one of the seats with a pleased sigh. This is truly grand, he said to himself happily. The Chatsworths entered the carriage and quickly gravitated to Charlie's compartment. Now this is traveling in style, Chatsworth exclaimed, unaware of Charlie's earlier comment. Chatsworth's voice trailed off in surprise as Max suddenly stood up and rushed suddenly towards the door of the compartment, only to stagger back temporarily dazed as it suddenly burst open. Two men in dark robes and turbans rushed in, brandishing knives and shouting loudly. What little could be seen of their faces looked harsh, even evil. Rosie shrank back against her seat and screamed as Chatsworth stood up blustering, Now see here! You can't come barging in here like that! One of the invaders cast him a contemptuous look and then punched him roughly aside. Chatsworth stumbled and fell awkwardly to his knees, glasses flying. Infuriated, Rosie pounced, forgetting that the attacker was armed and outweighed her considerably. Coward! Attacking a defenseless old man, she yelled, and threw a wild punch which might have done some damage had it connected. The bandit simply ducked, then grabbed her arm, pulling her towards him. He bared his blackened teeth in a grin and said something in Arabic. Even though Charlie didn't understand the words, the intent was clear. Get your hands off her, he exclaimed, and grabbed the bandit strongly from behind, pulling him away from Rosie. She promptly started to wind up for another punch when her attention was caught by a movement behind Charlie. Charlie, look out, behind you, she yelled, and he whirled to see the invader who had pushed the door open, advancing menacingly, knife held out in front of him. Charlie glanced around frantically and saw Chatsworth's heavy satchel nearby. He scooped it up hastily by the strap, swung it with all his strength, and let it fly. The bag smacked into the attacker's shoulder, sending him staggering away, slightly dazed, and Charlie was about to leap after him when Rosie screamed again. Swiveling around, he saw the first brigand's knife rise, Rosie's pale face directly in its path, and he launched himself in an all-out tackle. Rosie went flying as Charlie and the bandit rolled around on the floor, each trying to get some purchase to wallop the other. On the other side of the room, Max and the second bandit were engaged in a battle of their own. Charlie and the first invader were still wrestling, and Chatsworth had pulled his daughter to some degree of safety in a corner when the scuffling was suddenly and unexpectedly interrupted by a single, unbelievably loud gunshot. The combatants froze and turned involuntarily as one towards the door, only to see Max standing with a weapon smoking in his hand. His erstwhile assailant stood still, as if paralyzed, a look of shock on his face which changed to horrified comprehension as blood began to seep through the fabric of his robe. Dropping his knife, he clutched both hands to his chest as if to stem the tide of fate, but too late. With eyes bulging, his knees gave way, and he dropped to the floor right in front of Charlie, dead as the proverbial doornail. Charlie and his opponent stared at each other, then at the dead man, and then each other again, and then the remaining bandit made a quick decision. Snarling something inarticulate, which the shaken Chatsworth later translated as, no sum is large enough, the bandit suddenly shoved away from Charlie. Startled by the move, Charlie's hold slackened, giving the other man enough room to deal him a wicked blow to the side of the head and wrench himself away. 
Thinking only of escape, the brigand rose hastily and bolted for the door, only to stop in his tracks as he found himself facing Max's pitiless eyes. Max seized him with powerful arms and yanked him by the scruff of the neck to the end of the moving carriage, where he pulled the door open and promptly flung the man outside. There was a terrifying shriek as the man flew through the air, and then a sickening thud as his body landed heavily on the ground outside, bones breaking like twigs as he tumbled and rolled down the railway embankment and out of sight. Max returned and dragged the body of the dead man to the open doorway and threw him out as well, closing the carriage door behind him, and then he calmly collected the knives that the visitors had left behind, while the others stared at him open-mouthed. After a moment, he glanced up to meet Charlie's shocked gaze. What? he said with contempt. You just killed two men in cold blood, said Charlie slowly. Max shrugged. They were trying to kill us, weren't they? Charlie was trembling, with anger, horror, delayed fright, or possibly a combination of all three. We don't know that for sure. They may have only been robbers. Max looked unrepentant, and Charlie felt he had to make an attempt at upholding decency. I'm sorry, Max, I just don't understand. How can you be so cold and ruthless? Max's scowl deepened, and the tone of his voice increased. You're right, you don't understand. I've been in this kind of situation before, and you haven't. Sometimes you have to act quickly and take the first blood. That or be killed yourself. Kill or be killed, if you want to survive, that is. Max came right up to Charlie and stared directly at him, just a few inches from his face. I could see it in their eyes, Mr. Charlie, trust me, they would have killed us all. Without another word, he turned his back and settled in the far corner, where he sat with arms folded and eyes closed. It was clear that he was not going to engage in any further discussion of the matter. Still revolted, Charlie shook his head, which made him a little dizzy, and Rosie let out a cry of alarm. Charlie, you're bleeding. Taking her handkerchief, she pressed it against the side of his head where he had been struck. After a moment or two, the bleeding stopped, and Rosie, somehow just naturally, slipped into the circle of Charlie's arms. They stood quietly for a minute, and then she looked directly into his eyes. You saved me. Charlie Waterman, she whispered, and kissed him on the cheek as they lingered in each other's arms for a moment. Then she firmly settled him in one of the seats to rest until they reached Cairo. Cairo was a revelation. Next to the turmoil of its streets, the hurly-burly of the Alexandria wharves looked positively sedate. Charlie shoved the notebook deep into his inside jacket pocket and firmly buttoned the jacket to keep away potential pickpockets, although he found himself hunching as he walked so that he constantly felt its reassuring weight against his side. Max gave him an odd look, but refrained from commentary other than to lead him to the carriage waiting to take them to the hotel. The hotel was not very far from the station or the Museum of Antiquities but far enough for the shocked young Englishman to get a first-hand view of the grinding poverty in which many of the city's inhabitants lived. Ragged, filthy children ran through the streets, screeching offerings of a multitude of goods and services, legal and illegal, for a minimal amount of money. Beggars missing one or more extremities, or even eyes lined the streets, congregating on corners and in doorways, hands outstretched to the passers-by as they called for bakshish, in pitiable voices. There were also legitimate merchants, some set up in a loose organization of tents, others hawking their wares in carts, a bewildering display of food, cloth, brass containers, intricately tooled leather goods, and animals, most of whom were contributing to the noise of the crowd with their own cacophony of bleeding, whinnying, braying, punctuated periodically by the hoarse cough-like sound of camels grunting. Charlie felt a pluck at his sleeve and turned to see a hopefully grinning vendor holding up a complicated brass object, boasting pipes and tubes. He started to ask what it was when Max reached by him and pushed the object away. 
Imshi. Yella, off with you. We're not interested in your trash, Max growled, punctuating the command with a foul glare. The vendor flinched back, mumbling to himself, and Charlie turned to Max. What was all that about? he asked. What was that thing anyway? Something dangerously resembling a wry grin tried to get a foothold on Max's face, but lost the battle. Huka, he said succinctly. Charlie was temporarily lost. Huka? Then the penny dropped, and he flushed. Opium. The Middle East was inundated by the stuff, and England's more alarmist newspapers often carried pieces decrying the influence of the drug on those nations where England had an interest. Oh, I didn't realize they were so elaborate, he added diffidently, trying to sound blasé about it. There was definitely a gleam of amusement in Max's eyes now, but he forbore to comment, preferring instead to keep his enjoyment of Charlie's predicament to himself. Serve Mr. High and Mighty Moralistic Waterman right, he thought, time that young man saw what the real world was really like. The hotel, however, was another matter, a bastion of European charm and conveniences as if transported from another world. Regally presiding over a square of sorts and loosely modeled on the already famous Raffles Hotel in Singapore, it boasted white colonnades and gleaming windows overhung by colorful awnings. A café was set up near the main entrance, and European tourists clad in light-colored linens lounged at several of the tables, tall drinks at their elbows. Charlie couldn't help but reflect on the contrast between the poverty in the streets outside and the opulence of the hotel. Nevertheless, this was where they were staying. Mr. Sampson had booked it specially. He stole a glance at Max's impassive profile, but as usual had no clue what the other man was thinking. Probably some resentment towards the upper class, Charlie thought, with a small but very temporary pang. Well, Max was going to have to live with it. Despite the poverty outside, Charlie intended to enjoy whatever amenities the hotel had to offer before they left for Saqqara, and that included a drink or two and a good dinner, preferably in the company of one Rosie Chatsworth. At the front desk, Charlie was given a telegram, which turned out to be from Mr. Sampson. He read it through and then turned to Max. He wants to know how things are progressing, Max. Would you mind wiring him back and letting him know we're here safe and sound, please? He thanked the other man and started to turn away, then swiveled around again. Oh, Max, there's no need to alarm him about the incident on the train, thanks. Without waiting for a response, he started up the stairs to his room. He had just finished hanging up his dinner clothes to let out some of the wrinkling when there was a tap on the door. When he opened it, Rosie was waiting. I suppose you've never had a proper young lady visit you in your hotel room, she said pertly in response to his startled greeting. Without waiting for an invitation, she stepped inside and looked around. Isn't this hotel lovely, Charlie? Have you seen the fittings in the lavatory yet? Charlie had to smile at her enthusiasm. She tried to hide it well, but it was clear to him that Rosie often wished that her father's life had been more successful, that she had had all the things growing up to which he and Victoria were accustomed to. His smile dimmed as that train of thought reminded him that he hadn't been doing much thinking about his fiance lately. Firmly, he told himself that it was due to the events of the journey rather than the red-headed girl exclaiming over the furnishings of his hotel room. Somehow, he was having difficulty believing himself. Searching for a distraction, he spotted the small safe built into the wall. That's right, he thought. I need to store the notebook somewhere securely. That safe should do the trick. He turned the key in the safe and opened it, then extracted the notebook from his jacket pocket and slid it inside the cavity. After locking the safe again, he stood staring at it, abstractedly twirling the key around in his long fingers. Having finished her inspection, Rosie had come up beside him. What's the matter, Charlie? She asked. Oh, Charlie said absently. I'm debating where I should hide this key. She gave him a wicked look. I have an idea, she replied, and snatched the key out of his hand. Before he could protest, she turned away slightly and pulled up her skirt. 
He got a quick glimpse of strong legs before good manners kicked in, and he turned to give her more privacy, although his startled brain couldn't help but wonder why she hadn't simply gone in the other room first if she hadn't wanted him to see. You can open your eyes now, Charlie, Rosie said, amused. And if it will make you feel better, I have a small money belt that I wear where most people wouldn't think about. The key will be safe down there. His rebellious brain betrayed him, and he couldn't help but give her a wistful glance, Victoria's face failing to appear in his mind's eye at the crucial moment. Rosie gave him a coy smile in return, and then held out her hand. I think a cool drink in the cafe would be perfect, don't you? Charlie's mind was on only one thing now, and that was Rosie. It would be my pleasure, he replied gallantly, and they proceeded downstairs arm in arm. They were enjoying their second drink when Mr. Chatsworth appeared, a pleased look on his face. He sat down happily, sweeping off his hat and laying it on the table. Well, Charlie, we're all set. I've received permission to dig at Saqqara instead of Giza. I have the permit right here in my pocket. A waiter appeared, and Chatsworth gave his order for tea. Then he pointed a finger at Charlie. You know, that man of yours, while I was at the ministry negotiating the permit change, Max has rounded up some workmen and their foremen and made the arrangements for them to dig immediately. He's even acquired some camels. Charlie smiled inwardly to himself. Without question, Max had become a great asset to the expedition. His comprehensive army training and combat experience had proved to be very useful at every stage of their trip. Not only had Max organized the supplies and transportation for their journey, but he had dispatched a couple of robbers in the bargain, albeit violently, and had protected them from danger by preempting potentially dangerous situations. His stubbornness and tenacity were great qualities for an expedition leader, which was, in fact, what he had now become. Charlie realized that without Max, they would not have got thus far. Without Max, they would be nowhere. Charlie was slowly learning that the world was a dangerous place, and there was no substitute for an experienced hand on an expedition like this. The waiter returned with a cup of tea for Chatsworth, and after applying milk and sugar, Chatsworth raised his cup in a mock toast. Charlie and Rosie raised their half-finished drinks and glasses chinked with teacups as the three of them toasted the success of their expedition. After a pleasant dinner with the Chatsworths and even a glass or two of champagne to toast the next day's activity, Charlie was wending his way through the hotel lobby on his way to bed when it occurred to him that Max had not put in an appearance at dinner time. Wondering if Max was not feeling well, he turned towards the desk to inquire for the room number when he literally bumped into the ex-soldier in the hotel bar. Or, to be truthful, Max bumped into him, his limp more pronounced than usual. Max raised his head to peer at his rescuer. Oh, S.U. Yoon Mr. Waman. A substantial aroma of beer and whiskey emerged with each syllable, and Charlie coughed as he involuntarily inhaled a whiff. Strangely enough, Max took no offense at Charlie's reaction, seemingly content to lean on the young man's outstretched arm while surveying the swaying room from under heavy eyelids. Charlie couldn't abandon him like that. Come on, Max, let's get you up to your room he said briskly, and somehow manhandled the larger and much heavier man up the stairs. Once there, as soon as Charlie removed his supporting arm, Max collapsed solidly onto the bed, one arm thrown across his face. Charlie contemplated the scene for a moment, debating. He wasn't sure he felt right about tiptoeing off and leaving Max to his own devices, but the prospect of getting him undressed and into bed was definitely out of the question. As he stood there, irresolute, a voice emanated from the body on the bed. Thank you, Mr. Waterman. You are a gent. For once, Charlie's name didn't come with a slightly caustic undertone, and he leaned back against the wall and crossed his arms, intrigued. You don't say much, do you, Max? He remarked. The arm moved, 
and a bleary eye peered out. I speak when I need to speak, Mr. Waterman. Max heaved his body somewhat upright against the pillow. Having started, he seemed incapable of stopping. I was wrong about you, Mr. Waterman. I thought you was a spoilt rich boy. But you're not bad, really. You didn't do too badly in that fight today. There's many a man that would have run a mile. Charlie flushed, discomfited by Max's praise and uncertain whether he wanted to continue the conversation given the death of the two men. But Max was in a talkative mood. He caught at Charlie's hand and shook it as if to prove his point. Accepting the olive branch, Charlie tentatively expressed one of the thoughts that had been bothering him. You soon finished off those Arabs today, Max. And please, call me Charlie. Mr. Waterman's my father. Max leaned back and shook his head. That bandit would have killed us all. I could see it in his eyes. Even so, Max, Charlie argued, it was a bit of a shock to see a man killed like that. And the other one, the one you threw off the train, God knows what happened to him. The train happened, Max said dryly, his normal caustic humor attempting to rise up despite the blanket of alcohol. He ignored Charlie's sharply indrawn breath and continued, waving one hand about foggily in the air. You get used to killing when you are in the army, Charlie. It's what soldiers do you know, kill people. They take you in as a normal young man, all innocent-like. And then by the time they have trained you up, you'll slit somebody's throat for tuppence. It all becomes so easy. He stopped for breath, exhaling with a long sigh. The killing is easy, I mean. The bit that's hard, so hard, is seeing your friends die, while all the time you're scared stiff that screaming shell's got your name on it. The cork was truly out of the bottle now, but Charlie's innate kind nature kept him from making some kind of excuse and leaving. Max obviously hadn't spoken about his problems in some time, and better to let it come out now than at some later point in the expedition when everyone needed to be alert. I know, Max, he said carefully. Mr. Sampson told me that you fought in the Boer War. Max stared at Charlie his hazel eyes watery. I don't really like to talk about that, he slurred, and reached carefully into his jacket pocket, withdrawing a flask. Opening it, he started to raise it to his mouth, then belatedly remembered his guest and offered it to him. Trying not to fan away the newest fumes as Max leaned forward, Charlie shook his head politely. Is it something that bothers you? Charlie asked, squirming inwardly at the obviousness of his question. Max was oblivious to nuance. He took a healthy swig from the flask and then capped it with the exaggerated caution of the very drunk. Yes, Charlie, it is. Some good blokes got killed in that pitiful excuse for a war. Some of my best mates, in fact. One I'd known since we were small lads together. A tear formed in the corner of his eye. With a stupendous effort, he heaved himself upwards to stand, swaying gently as an alarmed Charlie started to rise himself, ready to try to catch him. But somehow Max stayed upright, and in fact he began pacing, the limp more noticeable than ever. He muttered to himself for a few moments, and then seemed to come to a decision. I will tell you about it though, Charlie, it's about time I got it off my chest. Charlie sat back, prepared to leap for Max if he started to fall, and waited. Max started to speak. It was the 11th of December, 1899, a day that I'll never forget as long as I live, 14,000 British troops under the command of Lieutenant General Lord Methuen. This last said with extreme venom. Attempted to fight their way to relieve the town of Kimberley. We were at a place called Magersfontein. He paused for another gulp of whiskey. The Boers, damn them, had dug trenches at the foot of the hill, giving their riflemen a greater firing range while we all wasted ammunition and lives trying to take the hill itself. He swiped at his eyes, which were suspiciously bright. They mowed us down and we dropped like flies, Charlie. Over a hundred dead and almost seven hundred wounded in no time at all. It was awful, like hell on earth. I thought I was a tough guy. It wasn't my first time under fire by any means, but I was so scared, Charlie. 
I was so scared. He grabbed at Charlie's hand, and Charlie realized with some surprise that Max was shaking like a leaf. One of my men had his head blowed off, right next to me, his blood and brain spattering all over my shirt. And then there was a flash and crack like thunder, and it all went black. He broke off, jamming both hands in front of his face in a futile effort to stop the tears. Nonplussed, Charlie sat, hoping the crying jag would soon diminish. He had no idea what might be an appropriate thing to say in such a situation, so he simply waited quietly as the other man's sobs slowly lessened. Finally, Max raised his head, the drowning eyes a watery grass green in the crumpled face. When I woke up, I was lamed. My best pal was missing in action, and my career was over. They sent me home and no one would tell me about Bobby for a long time. But I finally found out, Charlie. My mate Bobby was dead and buried like the rest of them on that godforsaken South African field, gone away for good. He shook his head slowly. Many good blokes died that day, Charlie. And for what? I ask you, for what? Unsure if he should answer, Charlie prevaricated, but it was a rhetorical question as far as Max was concerned. Max took another swig and savagely flung the empty flask at the wall. The upper-class officers survived, Charlie. That's always the case. The toffs send you off into battle, but they never suffer like the men do, the pompous lardy da bastards. It makes you wonder what the army's all about, Charlie. It makes you wonder what life's all about. I've never experienced anything like that, Charlie replied, rather nervously. It must be awful to see your friends killed. I lost my grandfather some years ago, and I often think about him. But when you love someone that much, they never die. They just live on in your heart. Max was past caring. The sudden burst of energy gone. He leaned exhaustedly back against the wall, his body sliding slowly downwards to the floor, where he sagged equally slowly to one side, his eyes closed. Charlie contemplated the collapsed figure with a mixture of pity and resignation. Right he said, bending to his task. Come on then, Max. Let's get you into bed. You're in for a sore head in the morning. With a superhuman effort, he once again heaved Max onto the bed, loosened his collar, and removed his shoes. That's as far as we're going to go, my friend, he stated, and straightened with a grunt. Max rewarded him with a gentle snore, and Charlie tiptoed out, dimming the light as he went. Back in his own room, Charlie found himself chasing sleep, which was apparently determined to elude him. Delayed reaction to the events of the day had already made him nervy, and he couldn't stop thinking about the horrors that Max must have experienced during his military career, particularly at Magersfontein. It seemed as if hours passed by while he tossed and turned, unable to rest. He understood in some way now why Max had been so angry towards him. Finally, he rose and retrieved his grandfather's Bible, reading the squire's annotations on the pages, until his tired eyes finally could stand the strain no longer, and he nodded off with the book in his hands. But his dreams were strange and restless, filled with inexplicable images and threatening figures, as if to warn him of upcoming peril.